Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Pavel, for inviting me here. Uh, and thank you for facing the cold and the snow to come over here today. Um, OK, so what I'm going to talk about today is more machine learning than really visual recognition. But it's you know, machine learning applied to visual recognition. And it's about deep learning and how we can learn compact, deep networks. So deep learning in the past few years has made a huge impact in visual recognition. And for instance, on the task of object recognition, here what I'm showing is, is a subset of the large data set that's ImageNet. Uh, it's, it's got millions of examples of images, and each image is associated with one class label, and, and there are a thousand classes uh, in, in, the, uh, in the challenge that they have. Uh, and so if we look at the progress based on deep learning, so, so there's a paper that shows that human performance on this data set is about 5.1% error, top five error, so which means that you get the correct class within the first five answers that you give. Uh, and even a couple of years ago, so 2015, there was a network that reached uh, below the human performance error, so, so better performance than humans so with 4.95% top five error. So it's really impressive what deep networks can do on this, on this task. Another problem is the problem of semantic segmentation. Uh, here I'm showing an example from the Cityscapes data set. So here you have one image, and the goal is to assign one label to every pixel in that image, and that's what's shown over here. So you see the people in red, uh, the ground in, in purple, the sky in blue, um, et cetera. And then again, here there's been huge progress based on deep networks. And the current state of the art is by a company that's called Mapillary. Uh, and their research department uh, has reached something like 82% intersection over union, which means that really you essentially have 82% of the pixels correctly. So this is really, really great, really great. And there's a big history of deep learning that dates back from, from the 90s, really. Um, and so the whole domain started with fairly small networks. So we started with network that, like the net, the net, which is a classical network. It has a few convolutional layers and subsampling layers. So really just a couple of convolutions, one fully connected layer, so, and, and not too many units per convolution, so a fairly small network. Now, that worked reasonably well for simple problems like character recognition, um, but Nowadays, people have gone to much deeper architecture. So, so really, the architecture that created the big gap in, uh, on the ImageNet challenge is what's called the AlexNet by Alex Krzyzewski. Uh, it was in 2012. They won the, the challenge by a large margin over more traditional uh, computer vision-based approaches. And they had a much deeper network with more convolutions, a lot more filters per, or units per convolution, and that made a big impact in terms of accuracy of recognition. And then it went deeper and deeper, and so the next step was the VGG uh, by people at Oxford. It's got, again, more convolutional layers with a number of filters, so it's getting deeper and deeper. And then, yet again, after that, a couple of years after that, the ResNet. And so the ResNet is this idea of residual units where you essentially compensate for the errors that you make in or uh, uh, as, you, as you go over the network. This is a fairly small version of the ResNet. It's got only 34 layers. That's already quite a, quite a bit, but it's, it's a fairly small version of ResNet. They've tested it up to 1,000 layers. They actually found out that 1,000 layer was not particularly useful, but, but up to 100 was really useful. Uh, and so really, we're going deeper and deeper into the networks. But ultimately, it's not really always very practical. So for instance, you know, when you want to buy your, your next autonomous car, and you open the trunk, and you realize that there's a huge supercomputer in the back of your, of your car, that's not really going to be very practical if you want to go on holidays and put your suitcase in, right? So really, what we need to do is go from deep to something that's much more compact, yet we still want to keep something that is as effective in terms of recognition accuracy. And so the questions that i like to discuss here today is really, is the size of uh, the key to the success of deep networks? And can we train compact networks to perform as well as very large ones? And just to give you a teaser, um, what I'll show is uh, at some point at the end of the talk that if you have a standard network uh, that has 3.7 million parameters, 
on something like character recognition, we get an accuracy of 89.3%. And with one approach that we developed uh, with one of my collaborators, uh, we get a network that performs just as well, or even slightly a little bit better, 90%, with only 290,000 parameters. So it's a 92% reduction in terms of the number of parameters for the same accuracy. Now, before I go there, um, I'm going to talk about something slightly different, and it's the idea of distillation. And in particular, I'm going to show some example of how distillation has been used for biomedical image segmentation. This is joint work with a uh, bachelor student from India who was visiting here last semester, and he did a, uh, a semester project with us. So the idea of biomedical segmentation, uh, image segmentation, is that we have an image like this one here, uh, where you have some structures, and we're interested in finding specific structures in this image, just as mitochondria, for instance, here. And so the output of what we want to get is something like this binary mask, where we have white regions that correspond to uh, mitochondria and black regions that correspond to other things in the image. Okay, but before I go into the actual problem of biomedical image segmentation, I want to talk a little bit about distillation. So the concept of distillation was introduced by Hinton and colleagues in 2015. And so the basic idea is that you're going to use a large network, a large teacher network, that you know you can train for the problem that you're interested in solving. And this teacher network is going to be used to train a smaller student network. And that's the network that, in the end, at test time, you're interested in using. That's a compact network. It can fit on a much smaller platform than the original teacher network. And the way this works is that you will use, instead of using the, the true labels to train your network, you're going to use some soft labels to train the students. And the soft labels are coming from the teacher. And I'll explain what this means, really, soft labels. is just some kind of distribution of the classes. And you get these values z that are coming from the teacher, which is the logit, so the output of the network just before the softmax layer, for those who know a little bit in, in more details how deep networks work. So just before getting the distribution from the, the softmax layer. And here you're getting some form of distribution with a different parameter temperature here. That means that you can essentially make your distribution more uniform. So by changing this parameter, you will get a distribution of labels uh, that is either very sharp around, around one label or much more uniform. And so by having softer labels, so a more uniform distribution of labels, it makes it easier to train the network. But it's also using what the teacher has already learned. And in particular, so the student is really learning to mimic the teacher, which means that if the teacher has found that there were similarities between two classes, and that therefore, when you have an example of one class, it will have fairly high probability of predictions for two different classes because they're very similar, then the student will try to predict these similar distribution, these similar probabilities as well. It also means that if, if the teacher has found one training example very hard to classify, or misclassified it even, then the student will say, OK, I don't care. I will also misclassify these training samples. Because it's too difficult. It's pointless to try to focus on this example to, to be trained. OK, now back to the biomedical image segmentation problem. What we're going to use in terms of network is what's called a U-net. It's called a U-net because of the shape of a U that it has. It was developed by uh, Ronald Berger and colleagues in 2015. It takes as input a biomedical image and outputs a segmentation mask for that image. It's got a bunch of layers uh, with downsampling and then so convolution layers, downsampling, convolution, downsampling. And then it's got skip connection going across to propagate the information from, uh, from the sort of low level information back to the, to the very end. Um, and uh, this is a standard network for, for biomedical image segmentation. It works, it's very effective as a matter of fact. But it's also got a lot of parameters. And so what we did with this is first try to reduce the, set, the size of this network to get a much more compact version of it. So in particular, the original network had, in the initial convolution, 64 units. So instead of starting with 64, we're going to try starting with 32, or 16, or 8, or 4, or 2. And then 
the original network, what it was doing was, was doubling the size of the units at every, at every step. So here it was 128. So instead of 128, if we have 32, then we'll have 64. If we have 16 here, we'll have 32 over there, etc. And so we keep doing exactly the same, the same round. So we, we'll decrease, we'll divide the size of the units by 2. And so here's what happened if you, well, oh, but, but before I forget, so we keep the same number of layers. So we're decreasing the number of units per layer, but we keep the same number of layers. And the reason is that this, this means that we still have the same field of view. So one, one output unit has seen exactly the same field of view in the original model or as in our, in, in our model. OK, and so if we train from scratch one of these reduced models, this is what happens. So here I'm saying the starting channel depth. So the original model was 64. And so we even try to, to increase it just to see what happens. But the main point is we try to decrease this initial size up to really 1. And what we can see is 64, the test loss was 0.1. 32, the, the, text, the test loss is actually even slightly sl smaller than originally, and et cetera, even up down to 4 the test loss is still very good. So what it means is that, in fact, this unit can already be trained in a much more compact form by, you know, from scratch, really, without doing any distillation or anything. But when you go to 2, well, then you get a very high test loss, and you cannot train this model. So what we were trying to do is use distillation to train a model whose starting depth was 2. We try to apply directly distillation uh, from this. So we tried what I call the four unit, which means a depth four as a teacher, to train a two unit. So a unit that has depth two as initial depth uh, as a student, which was the one that we could not train from scratch. And we tried for different temperatures. So this, this parameter that sets the uh, distribution of the, of the soft labels. We tried different values of, of this temperature parameter here. And we tried to train it, the network several times. So different trials. It's just different random initialization of the weights, really, um, to train the network. And what we see is that at different temperatures, sometimes we cannot train it, sometimes we can. Sometimes some temperature we cannot train it at all. Sometimes you know, a couple of trials we can or we cannot. So it's, it's really not stable at all. So even with distillation, training was not reliable. We were not able to really, really reliably train a two unit. So we did a couple of improvements or modifications of the original, uh, the original network. Uh, first, we used batch normalization layers. Uh, and the idea of batch normalization is to reduce the distribution shift. So we used that in the expansion part of the unit. And the second one we did was to do class reweighting to account for the fact that in biomedical image um, segmentation, you have a lot of background, so you have a lot of black areas for very few foreground areas. So it'll be very easy for the network to end up predicting always background, because it'd be not too bad in terms of training loss. And so with these two improvements, we ended up getting a, a pretty nice result where we could reliably train a two unit with distillation and these additional steps. And so here's the final comparison. We have the 64 unit, which is the original unit, which in terms of size corresponds to what I would call 100% of the size of the network. It's got a test loss of 0.1, an IOU of 80%. And so with our two unit, which is about 1% the size of the original one in terms of, of number of parameters, we get a loss that's just slightly higher with an IU that's just slightly lower. So we get a very good performance, very similar to the original one for a model that is only 1% the size of the original one. And here's just showing you the one example of the prediction in the on the image that I showed before, which seems pretty, pretty good in terms of accuracy, in terms of what it, it really manages to, uh, to segment. Now, so what are the lessons learned from this first approach? So distillation can help train smaller models if you maybe sometimes do a few tricks to, to help it work better. But it still requires to define the teacher and the student networks. And so we've seen that actually fairly small models can already be trained from scratch. But yet still, you don't know how to define this model. How many, how many units do you put in the layers of, of this unit, essentially, right? So now the next question that we had in mind was, can we automatically determine the smallest possible model for, for a task at hand? 
And this is what I'm trying to address in the next part, which is which I would call compression-aware training of deep network. And this is joint work with my former colleague, Jose Alvarez. So the idea that we had behind, behind this work was that you can prune the weights of a deep network. So imagine that you train a large network and that some of the parameters go to, to zero, that if some of the parameters go to zero, in a sense, they're not really useful. So they can be removed, right? Now, this seems very intuitive, but if you look really at it more carefully, it's not that obvious, particularly when we're talking about convolutions. So imagine that I have one convolution layer here where I have five three by three filters, right? So each of these rectangles here corresponds to one filter and it's a size three by three. So if I train my network and I end up with a few zero weights that are indicated in blue here, here, and there, I cannot really prune them because I still need to keep the filter, the convolution filter. I cannot just separate these parameters, right? So I cannot just really save anything because I cannot remove these weights. What I really need to, to have is that an entire filter goes to zero. And then I could be able to prune this filter and, and remove it entirely from my network and then really save some, some space. But it's very unlikely to just happen naturally that some entire, an entire filter goes to zero. Right? Even though we know that networks are over-parameterized, it's very unlikely that, that gradient descent just goes to some zero solution there. So what we propose to do is to try to encourage this to happen. And so we want to encourage entire units to go to zero. And so to do this, what we, we did is introduce a regular riser in the loss. So this is the loss that you're trying to minimize during training. So the first part, which I call L here, is just your standard classification loss, like cross entropy or something like this. We're trying to learn the parameters of the network such that you, you know, the prediction by the network, which is this function F, is close to the ground truth label. And we added one regularizer on the parameter, which is, you know, you can think of weight decay as being one such regularizer where we're just minimizing the norm of uh, the parameters, the square norm of the parameters. What we did instead of weight decay was use group sparsity. So the idea of group sparsity is you define some groups of parameters and you're trying to make entire groups to go to zero, which is exactly what we wanted to do. Uh, and so the way we formalized it is really for every layer here, we're looking at every unit in the layer and we're forming one group and we're trying to minimize the L2 norm. So this is what's called an L12 uh, norm, which is a group sparsity. Uh, so it will encourage entire units to go to zero if you try to minimize it. Now there was one step. And then we tried something else as well, uh, because group sparsity does not really consider the relationships between multiple units. So it's really working at the level of individual units. And so we had an idea that was coming from uh, the work uh, of Denton and colleagues. Uh, that was a post-processing step in their work. And what they said is that you can, if you have the parameters, so parameter matrix corresponding to one layer, and it has a low rank, you can decompose it into the product of two low rank matrix, smaller matrices, so you can save some, uh, some uh, number of parameters by doing this. Uh, but they did this as a post-processing, so we wanted to do this during training, so encourage the parameter matrix to have low rank, because again, it's quite unlikely that without doing anything, the parameter matrix will have naturally low rank, and you can do this decomposition without losing too much accuracy. Now, okay, I'm talking about parameter matrix. In practice, when we have convolutional layers, it's not so obvious what the matrix should be. And so the way we formalized the matrix was to say, okay, if you have the parameters of a particular layer here, that is a tensor, which are number of outputs times the number of inputs times the size of the filters, the dimension of the filters, then we just reshaped it as a matrix, which is number of output times this value, which is just the product of the other ones. And so this is the kind of matrices that we're working with. And so we then encoded the low rank as another regularizer, which is an approximation, convex approximation to uh, the rank function, which is the trace norm. Um, and again, we just use this in addition to the loss. And so in fact, you can use the two regularizers that are presented together. Um, so spar group sparsity and low rank, and we'll see what happens in terms of the results in, in a short while. 
And so once, once you train the network, you still need to oppose processing to actually reduce the size of the network. And so the only thing that you do is if you have an entirely zero doubt unit, you can just get rid of it. And then you get the, the, the parameter matrices of the different layers. And you can do an SVD to decompose them into low rank representations. OK, so some results. The first one that I'll show are on the character recognition data set. So it's characters recognition in the wild. Uh, so you have different things, you know, like logos or, or just signs on buildings. You can have characters that were fairly poor illumination conditions. And so the idea is just to recognize all these characters. Um, and here are the results in terms of numbers. So we used a uh, network, so that's called DEC3, uh, which is a decomposed network. It's the, sort of a baseline. So it's got 3.7 million parameters. It's getting this 88%, 88.6% uh, accuracy. Um, and so then we use the post-processing of Denton and colleagues, so the low rank post-processing. You see that you gain very little, so it compresses only by 3% the network. So here I'm, I'm looking at compression rates, right? So the higher, the better. Um, it you know, maintains the accuracy, but it's got only very little uh, reduction in terms of the number of parameters. If we use our group sparsity based regularizer, we already reduce by 86% the size of the network for slightly higher accuracy, as a matter of fact. If we use our low rank only, we get 80%, so slightly less than the group sparsity in this case. And if we use both low rank and group sparsity, we get to 92% accuracy, uh, 92% in terms of compression rate for a pretty good accuracy, so slightly even higher than the original one. So really, we reduced the size of the network by 92% and kept the uh, accuracy the same or even slightly higher. And so here's another example for uh, object recognition on the, the data set ImageNet. So the big data set, different objects in different you know, conditions. You have sometimes image nicely centered on the object, sometimes not at all. Sometimes you have a lot of cluttered backgrounds. Sometimes the illumination conditions are very different, difficult. Um, <clears throat> And so here are the results again. So here the baseline network was the ResNet with 50 layers. It's got 18 million parameters for a top one accuracy of 74.7%. If we do post-processing for low rank, we get only 4% compression rate. If we do group sparsity, we get 17%. If we do low rank, we get 20%. If we do both together, we get 27% uh, reduc uh, compression of the network. So. It means, of course, the compression rate here is not as big as in the previous case, so which means that we still need a fairly large network. Uh, but we still, still reduce the size for a very good accuracy. OK, so to conclude, what I showed is that you can directly learn a network so as to make it compact. And so we try to encourage this by using group sparsity and lower rank. It seems that using them together does help. Now, currently, with, with the approach that I presented, uh, the number of layers of the network is fixed. Now, in practice, when you have ResNet that has these sort of skipped connections, you could also try to encourage entire layers to disappear. So essentially, if you get the parameters of a residual block to go to zero, then you just get, have the skips and this connection. So you can essentially get rid of these layers. We haven't tried this yet. Now, another thing is with what I presented, training is still uh, done on the large network initially. And so there's still a point where you need to define a large network. Now, we are working on trying to develop new losses uh, to directly train a compact network so that you really can train even on your small network and try, uh, hopefully, to get optimal performance for that small network directly. And with this, that concludes my talk. So I'll be happy to take any question. Yep. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, did you try to compare your approach with other form of uh, using, you know, like of having compact neural networks like uh, SqueezeNet, for instance? I don't know if you heard about it. It's uh, basically it's like uh, AlexNet, but uh, uses this kind of compression and then uh, expansion layers uh, that uh, basically reduce a lot of number of the parameters and 50 times smaller than, uh, than AlexNet, but they have the same, as you said, the same. So, so the question is whether we did compare against other methods, other compression methods like uh, SqueezeNet. Um, I don't think we have the, comp the comparison against the SqueezeNet. I'm not. 
I'm not sure what kind of compression rates they can achieve with the squeeze net really though. Um, we have comparison against other ways of doing it. People have used the L1 norm minimization or that sort of things. We have these kind of comparisons, but I don't, we don't have explicitly the comparison against squeeze net, no. Yep. Does it come with drawbacks at the training time? Like, does it make training a slow? No, we found that, or oh, it, it does make training, oh sorry, the question is, is whether it makes training slower or it has drawbacks during training. Uh, so we, we found that there's very little difference in terms of the training time. So the way we're optimizing it is by a method that's called projected uh, stochastic gradient descent. So essentially you do a few steps of your regular gra stochastic gradient descent, and then you do a projection based on the regularizer. And the projection of, with the regularizers that we use, the projection is, um, is very is very easy, so it, it's quite fast. So we, we found that it had very little, little uh, overhead in terms of training. So, any more questions? So, there will be a chance to ask more questions. Yeah. So, we'll go to our next speaker. Thank you. And we have a second microphone to improve the quality of the sound.